imagine like two suffixes, like the E for the energy. Now you, you might put an actual value, say you've got a discrete um, quantized value for the energy, you might like, you might put say EI here, and a particular uh, value for the momentum, you might like, put here like PJ. Now in the direct notation, it's a sort of shorthand, you just, you tend to forget about the psi, you don't even use it. You, you just, you, you know, you use your usual direct uh, angular bracket notation. Now this is, this is usually called a, a ket, right? You've, uh, we've done that before, so a bit of revision here. So you can label your ket now by, uh, you can put here the value um, of the energy that you measured and the value of the momentum that you measured. And you can measure these two compatibly, compatibly, right? And so you can put the two, the two values here. Now, the generic uh, label, if you like, E, and E could take a, you know, a whole range of discrete energy values, and similarly for P, or it may even be continuous. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> just, just to keep things simple, let's imagine uh, these um, quantum, uh, quantum values here are uh, quantized, discrete. Right? We can do the continuous case later. It's more complicated. But so, um, so, so you've got to imagine here EI and PJ, right, inside, inside the angular brackets. And that ket would describe the, the uh, wave function, the state, the, eigen, the eigenstate of the energy and the momentum. And uh, you, know, you, you could, like if you had uh, big N uh, possible energy eigenvalues and big M possible momentum values, then how many uh, different kets could you have? Well, big N times big M, right? So uh, that's that's one way of labeling the ket, the the kets. Now uh, remember this because we'll uh, we'll be using these um, direct ket uh, ket vectors uh, where you actually put in the value of the wave. Um, the eigenvalues here. And if you had three uh, observables that are compatible and you measure all three, you might have a, uh, an eigenstate that has a third uh, eigenvalue written in here. That's, that's, that's possible. And you can generalize you know, to, to as many as you want. Okay? All right, now uh, perhaps I should put two bars. Uh, um, yeah, running out of board uh, and uh, this session. So we're getting into a new topic, well sort of, now. Um, uh, so we, we now have a criterion for, a, a compact criterion in terms of the, the commutator to judge whether two observables are compatible or not. Okay? Now we know the HUP, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, the HUP, is uh, an instance or an example of uh, incompatibility. Right? So we should, your know, intuition says, we, we should be able to form some kind of relationship between the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the commutator. Does that sound plausible? Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, we know we know using the the commutator. If the commutator is zero then we have compatibility between the two observables. And uh, in the case where it's not zero, uh, you know, we could uh, imagine the two observables are momentum and position, uh, let's say along the x-axis, then we get the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So uh, let's, try, let's now try to find a relationship between the commutator and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We, ought, we should be able to do that. All right. Now, in, in order to be able to do that, we need a more precise mathematical definition of uncertainty. Like, uh, you, you, now I think I hinted at the, I think I mentioned this uh, in passing rather quickly, oh, way back, uh, many lectures ago in, in this course, uh, that we probably would later uh, redefine more precisely uh, what we meant by the uncertainty in uh, energy, sorry, position measurement or momentum 
measurement. Well, now, now the time's come, right? We, we are now going to define the uncertainty in, a, in uh, the measurement of an observable A uh, this way. Um, we're, going, we're going to use statistics. We're going to talk about standard deviations and variance. Now, these are two technical terms from the theory of statistics. Now, I hope, I hope you've done some statistics. Uh, this, this term, now, this delta here uh, is the standard deviation. And uh, <coughs> the, square <coughs> the square of a standard deviation in statistics is called the variance. Right? And there's a formula. So here you have the square of the standard deviation, this uh, delta D or you know, delta A is the standard deviation of the measure, measurement values of the observable A. Right? Now, from statistics, nothing to do with quantum mechanics, but just from statistics, the standard deviation squared is called the variance, and there's a formula for the variance, and that is, it's the mean value, the average, or the expectation value, well, it's quantum mechanics. It's the average of the square of your what you're measuring minus the square of the average of what you're measuring. Now, uh, I, I will actually derive it. I'm just giving you a taste now, because you're know, running out of board. I, I will give you a t uh, I will actually derive this in statistics in the next uh, session, uh, in case you haven't done any statistics, um, just, just uh, as a bit of a tangent. Uh, I don't know how many times I've <laughs> been shocked at the level of ignorance, especially, especially amongst feminists of all people. They, they, just, they just don't know any statistics. So when, when they complain, see I'm a masculist, men's liver, and now I'm really getting off on a tangent, you know, just, just one or two minutes, because it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I hear feminists complaining about the glass ceiling. You know, at, at very high levels, uh, women are underrepresented. And I, I try to tell them as a masculist, men's liver, well, that's perfectly normal. It's a natural consequence of the phenomenon, statistical phenomenon, of GMV, greater male variance. And then I tell them, uh, and they, often they stare at me, they don't know what I'm talking about. They don't know, they don't know enough statistics to know what variance even means. You know, they may not even have heard of the term. So I have to explain, I have to give them a two minute uh, statistics lesson. And I'll tell them things like, well, every year in the US, hundreds of thousands of uh, school kids have their IQs measured. And therefore you can easily, very accurately find the average value of the IQs for boys and girls, and uh, same. That's not surprising, the IQ tests are devised so that they're the same. But what is interesting is the variance. Uh, the males have a 10% larger variance than the females. And variance uh, here, the, the square of the standard deviation, you, you can look on variance just as a, a measure of the spread outness of the bell curve. You know, the, the bell curve just, just gives you the distribution of uh, various scores in a, in a population. So if you're talking IQ scores, uh, that means that uh, at the extreme fringes of the bell curve, you know, if here's your bell curve, uh, so this, this axis would be the proportion of the population getting a particular IQ score, and you, your score goes along the x-axis, the proportion goes along the y-axis. You get this sort of bell-shaped bell looking curve. That's why it's called a bell curve. Now, the male IQ bell curve is more spread out than the female bell curve. So the male curve will be shorter and fatter. And the female bell curve will be taller and thinner. Now, in practice, because, because that difference in the variance is only 10%, uh, it means for the vast majority of the population, the abilities, or at least the IQs, of uh, males and females overlap almost totally, right? That's, uh, you, you, know, you can just look at the male curve and the female bell curves, you know, the two bell curves, uh, superimpose them, 
and uh, they al almost overlap totally, but not quite. At the extreme fringes, like the moron end of the curve, more males. And if you go out far enough, like five, six standard deviations, they're all males. So, so uh, in society, those people who are just so stupid that they can't hold down any job, they can't even sweep the streets, they are so dumb, they are males, just you know, exclusively males. And if you go at the other extreme, the genius end, again, all males. Now, in mathematical physics is a, is a profession dominated by brilliant, you know, genius level, uh, theoretical physicists who are males. Right? So I don't see any glass ceiling. Well, there might be to some extent, but, but it's sort of to be expected because you know, these, these uh, brilliant uh, male theoretical physicists know about this phenomenon. They know about GMV. They know what variance means. They, they know that the IQ variance <coughs> for males is 10% larger than females. And they, they can do the math. They can calculate what proportion of uh, men to women at, let's say, four standard deviations above the mean in, in the IQ distribution, or five standard deviations, or six standard deviations. And when, when you're at Nobel Prize winning level, yeah, you're over 200 IQ then, uh, yeah, you can do the math, and the proportion of women above 200 IQ compared to men is, I don't know, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, something like that. And that sort of fits the data, because the uh, proportion of women who have won science Nobel Prizes is, is about 3%, right? And it fits the data. In fact, you can calculate at each, at each uh, you know, for a given number of standard deviations above the average value, you can calculate from this from the two bell curve formulas uh, for males and females uh, the proportion of males to females at at that ability level at one standard deviation above the average, or two, or three, or four, or five, and then you can go out into the real world and compare the theoretical proportions you know, at, at each ability level and compare with the real world, and if the data yeah, the real world data fits the theory very well. So, uh, well, that's a tangent, but an interesting tangent and a bit of a lesson in statistics. Um, you know, <laughs> a, pro a fair proportion of society uh, don't know enough science, they don't know enough math, they don't know enough statistics to appreciate what the concept of GMV, greater male variance, means. And so I, I get impatient with these, I label them uh, iscyanate, iscyanate, which just means ignorant of science, it's sort of like illiterate or enumerate, can't do math. Uh, you know, virtually all the feminists that I meet, because um, yeah, I'm a mascot, so I talk about gender roles a lot uh, with feminists and mascots. Most of them, I would say, are iscyanate and enumerate. And so they don't understand what I'm talking about when I talk about GMV. So anyway, that's just, that's just for fun, thrown in as a, as a tangent, uh, a side issue. But you, you got a bit of statistics out of it. So next session, uh, I will actually derive this formula uh, in statistics, that the, the variance is equal to the, the mean of the square minus the square of the mean. And then I'll use that uh, definition of the standard deviation. I'll define what standard deviation means. I'll, I'll give you a mini uh, condensed uh, little lecturette in the basics of uh, statistics, the, the concept of standard deviation and variance, and then use it in the context of the commuter and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But that's for next session.